I searched the world But it couldn't fill me Man's empty praise And treasures that fade Are never enough You came along And put me back together now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than
Good morning. It's so good to see all of you here today. We especially welcome those of you who join us online with us this morning. We're so glad that you've tuned in today to experience worship at First Baptist Richardson. Guests, and we have guests with us every week. We're so glad that you've joined us today. Maybe you received a bulletin this morning. At the bottom of that, there's a little tear-off. You can give us some information. We would like to connect with you and help you take your next steps in getting connected at First Baptist Richardson. You can place that in the offering plate. It'll be coming by later in the service. Or after this service, we'd love to meet you. Some of our pastors will be in the next steps room right out these doors. We'd love to meet you and help you again get connected right here at First Baptist Richardson. A lot of great things are happening at First Baptist. We have WOW on Wednesday, and we have something special coming up in October. Prayer has been such an important part of what we have been about in this year. We have a special emphasis coming up in October. It's a prayer for the salvation of those in our community and beyond. And we'd like for all of our church to participate in this season of prayer. There'll be slots where you can sign up. We want somebody praying every single hour of that entire week. So yes, some of you will need to pray at two in the morning, but hey, somebody's got to do it, all right? We'd love for you to get involved. You can text the number or you can visit at the welcome desk after the service today. Now, let's take a look at the screens for some other upcoming things at First Baptist. Well, good morning. I'm James Westbrooks. We're shaking things up a little bit and doing video announcements. You will start to see a rotating lineup of church members giving you the scoop of what is coming up in our church. Who knows? This may be the big break for one of us, maybe. Now, the other announcements for this week. Pancake Day is coming on October 21. Students will be selling tickets as a fundraiser, an opportunity for camp, choir tour, and mission trips. You can get yours from one of our teenagers at the Mission Cafe or by texting PANCAKE to 972-235-5292. This Wednesday is Carol's Choir Kickoff. Here's a little more about Carol's Choir. We hope you can join us this year. Joy to the world. It's a Christmas countdown. Would you believe we are only 13 weeks away from Christmas Day? At Carol's each December, our church is able to share the true meaning of the season in a creative way with our community. There are many ways to get involved from being in the nativity cast, crew, greeters, and singing in the choir. We are kicking off our Carol's rehearsals on Wednesday night, October the 4th. Would you join us as we prepare to bring the joy of Christmas to our community this holiday season? Hello, I'm Bill Davis, Chair of Your Church Council, and I'm coming to you with one voice from the Church Council. I'm happy to report there are several exciting things going on here at First Baptist Richardson. We are a couple of weeks into our new WOW Wednesdays, and they have been, well, WOW! We've had more than 100 people join us for dinners prepared by Chef Clint, a variety of seminars, prayer groups, and Bible studies that have all been well attended. There's a renewed level of excitement going on around the fellowship. If you have not participated yet, I encourage you to join a group and experience this excitement for yourselves. Since I gave that first report back in June, our congregation has done a remarkable job of overcoming our deficit and getting us back into the black. But we've slipped a little bit in the past few weeks. So I encourage you to remain faithful and consistent in your giving. Remember, consistency is very important to both our habits and to honoring God's command to us. Now let me get back to that term I started this talk with, one voice. What does that mean? When I was in the business world, we used to say we wanted a single source of the truth. We wanted to be able to go to a single place to get the data that we needed. If we had that data in multiple locations, maybe multiple databases, how could we ever be sure we're getting the same information when it's coming from multiple sources? In the church, that single source of the truth 
is God's Word, the Bible, and how it is presented in our weekly messages from our pastor or interim pastors as we now have. In order for our church to hear that same voice, we video transmit our sermon between the two worship venues each week, and we have periodic together services so we can all hear the same message from the same scripture passage by our pastor, a one voice message. The church council is firmly convinced that our next pastor will align with this one voice concept also. Thank you for allowing me to come to you today in a one voice message from your church council to tell you about the exciting times happening right here at FBCR. Please remain consistent in these things. Praying for our pastor search committee. Praying for our next pastor. We may not know who that might be yet, but God already knows giving to the Lord through the ministry of this church, participating in the activities and ministries of FBCR, welcoming visitors we have coming to our church every week, and finally, see who you can invite to bring to our church. And now will you join me in prayer for our church? Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunities you set in front of us. Thank you for the history we have in this community and what we've meant to this community for the past 150 years. We pray we're here for another 150 years to continue to serve. Now, Lord, we pray for our pastor search committee, and we especially pray for that next pastor that is already out there that you know about. Thank you for the opportunities you set before us. All these things I pray in your name. Amen. Let's stand as we continue to worship and give thanks to God for what he's done for you, for me.
what he's done and for who he is. Let's read together from the book of 2 Samuel. As we've been going through the well, we have just read this chapter from 2 Samuel. We hope that all of our church is participating in reading a chapter from the Bible every day of the week. Let's read together these words of David. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge, my Savior, you save me from violence. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in him. For who is God but the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? God is my strong refuge and has made my way blameless. He made my feet like the feet of a deer and set me secure on the heights. The Lord lives and blessed be my rock and exalted be my God, the rock of my salvation. We go to the Lord now in prayer as we prepare to give. We give of our time, our talents, our resources. We dedicate it to the Lord. Tim Spires comes to lead us. Please pray with me. Father God, we're so thankful for just to be in this house, in your house. Uh, we thank you for your presence of the Holy Spirit, the way that the Holy Spirit is moving in this place, in this church. And we we thank you so much for your salvation, that indescribable gift, uh, the gift that comes through faith in Jesus. And Father, we come to you humbly today. Um, Father, and we just, uh, we thank you for your goodness and your grace and your mercy. And we thank you for your generosity. And we're just humbled, Lord, that you are the creator. We acknowledge that, that you're the creator of heavens and the earth, and that you made all things, 
Um, all things were made through you and for you. And Father, we're called to give back a portion of those things that we've been given, whether we have a little or a lot. Uh, we're, we're called to give generously and joyfully. So, Lord, I pray that um, as we do that today, Lord, that um, you would bless these gifts, that they would be used for your kingdom work. And, Lord, as the deacons um, pass out the offertory plates, Lord, I pray that you would bless these gifts and offerings, that they would be, um, they would just exalt your name, and that your name would be glorified in, um, in all that's given today. And we pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Life for the rich and the poor Son of David, righteous and just He's come to rescue us He is the way, oh Jesus Sing out with a new song Ring out with a new dawn
is good to see you. Andy, great worship choir and orchestra. Hey, let's give them a bigger hand than that, all right? You know, so many churches today are, are uh, abandoning choirs and orchestras, and man, I, I'm a, I love the worship experience with that, and I know that you do, and it's good for sending me to be back with you. You have to endure me for four weeks, okay? And uh, so that'll give you a higher place in heaven, all right? And uh, so thank you for inviting me back and to be a part of it. God is moving, uh, yes sir, thank you. Uh, in this church, uh, I, I'm excited, Andy, about what you guys are doing on Wednesday night. I hear you had a great crowd the other night, and praise the Lord for that. I believe there's a hunger today for the Word of God that is, that is uh, because of the condition of our culture. And so I'm excited about what God's doing here, and, and we're glad. And, and I always want you to know that when I come to preach with you, I, I'm not about just going digging up some old sermons and rehashing them and hoping. I'm always going to be praying about what God wants to do during this time. And over these next four weeks, I'm going to be doing four parables, okay? Uh, parables are very much a part of the teaching in the Scripture. There's over 50 of those in the Scripture. And uh, we're going to be looking at four of those. And you say, Gary, what, what, tell me about parables. Well, I, I call them hidden gems. In other words, there's something down below the surface that God wants us to understand and to grow by. And we're going to be digging down into those gems because a parable, teaching in this way, was something not only that Jesus used, it was used throughout the teaching world. It was a common practice. And what Jesus did was take a human story and lay it down next to a spiritual truth. And he would take that spiritual truth, he'd want to teach it, and so he'd reach out into the world and pull up a parable or a story, or sometime even just a statement to help people understand what he's saying. Now, what's good about the parable we look at today is he did us a favor because he explained it later, okay? I'm gr grateful for that as well. And so we'll be looking at these parables as, as extended metaphors uh, of the truth of God. Now, one thing you'll know as you study through the Scriptures and you look at parables, there is usually just one central truth in the parable. A lot of details, but I want you to know that uh, sometimes the details, we try and make more out of them than they are, and any detail we would make into a spiritual truth has to be supported somewhere else in Scripture, because Jesus wasn't preaching the story, He was preaching truth. And so you always want to find that somewhere else in Scripture. But we're going to look today at a parable in which I believe there is one thing that Jesus is trying to say to us. And let me tell you what that is. You know, they say to people when they're preaching, tell them what you're going to say and tell them again and tell them again and tell them again. So let me start there, okay? What Jesus is trying to say to us today is if you want to know what makes you and me receptive to the Word of God more than anything else— it is the condition of our heart that when we gather for worship and Bible studies, when we open our Bibles for a quiet time, what determines the impact it has upon our lives? What determines? Is it the quality of the preaching? Is it the, the talent of the teacher? Uh, is it somebody with new ideas or good ideas? No. The main ingredient to understanding the Word of God in a way that would impact our lives and change us is the condition of our heart. And he's going to show us today that when we open the Word of God, it isn't about hearing with our physical ears. It is hearing with spiritual ears. And the way we hear with spiritual ears is to get our heart ready to hear it. In fact, what we ought to be doing when we come to worship as we drive is, Lord, get my heart ready. Lord, now get my heart in the right condition so that I can hear the Word of God and it can impact my life and it can change me as well. So open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 13, if you wouldn't. By the way, let's just stand, if we could, and honor the Word of God. We're going to be doing some other Scripture reading, but here in the beginning, uh, it'll kind of help our blood get moving, okay? If we'll stand up. Matthew chapter 13, we're going to read the first nine verses on the same day. Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea. And great crowds gathered around him so that he got into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach. By the way, I, I just Sandy and I just got back from Israel. There's only one place in the entire Sea of Galilee area that this could be done. 
And they say that they put people down in a boat and allowed them to speak, and the reflection of the voices off the water could be heard by thousands by what Jesus said. And so he got into this boat, and the crowd stood on the beach, and he told them many things in parables. A sower went out to sow. As he sowed, some seeds fell along the path. The birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil. And immediately they sprang up since there was no, uh, but since there was no depth in the soil, when the sun rose and they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell amongst thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil. Now, you know where the good soil is, right here in the heart. Other seeds fell on the good soil. It produced grain, some a hundredfold, some 60, some 30. He who has ears to hear, let him hear what God is saying to us through his word. You may be seated. Thank you. What you see in this text are several different things that we need to clarify in the beginning. First of all, the seed that he's talking about is the word of God, and that the word of God is to be scattered. And that's one of our responsibilities as a church and as the people of God to scatter the Word of God. And it is word about the kingdom, of what the kingdom means. It is truth from the Scripture. But what he says in this is that as the Word of God is scattered, there will always be different responses. People will look at it different. They will, they will understand it different. But the transformation is not due to the Word of God because the Word of God is powerful. It never changes. It is truth, eternal truth. It is something the Bible said is sharper than a two-edged sword that seeks down deep into the soul and changes the life. But what determines whether that's going to happen? Because I think this morning, if we just stopped for a minute and started adding up in this room all the hours you've spent listening to guys like me, okay, and Bible study teachers, and opening your Bible at your house, and doing all of that, is your transformation built upon the number of hours that you have heard the Word of God? No, it's not. What changes the life is when the heart is ready and receptive, when we have done a work within our soul to make our soil right, so that we can be able to be transformed by the Word of God. What Jesus said is there's basically three or four different conditions of the heart. There's three or four different ways that we can come. He really is saying in this text that there's three or four hearers of the Word of God. He said, first of all, there's the person who shows up and listens to the Word of God, and they have what he would call a hard heart, that it is possible to give priority to opening our Bible, to coming to church, sitting in a Bible study, listening to someone teach the Word of God. But if we listen with a hard heart, the Bible says it's not going to bear any fruit. It's not going to take any root. Now, you, you see the illustration that he's using right here, that, that, that he's talking about something that, that, that is, is transforming within our lives. And he says in, in these verses, in verse number 18, he says, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and doesn't understand it, the evil one comes and snatches it away that has been sown in the heart, and what is sown is along the path. In other words, what he was describing is a pathway. You, you and I know very clearly what a pathway is. It is a piece of ground in the middle of something that is well-worn by the activity of life. It, it, people going down the, that way walking. Or maybe if you've been out, people who have farms, you see the pathway that the cattle take. Or maybe it is down in, in an area where wagons or different cars have gone. Well, what begins to happen? Because of the impact of those things, it becomes hardened. And what Jesus said is that's the condition of many people's hearts. Their lives are, yes, being lived e even in the church, uh, being lived in this world, but instead of being transformed by God, our hearts can become hardened by the world, can be hardened by what's going on within our lives. There are many people that I find that, that, that as they live their life, they become very bitter at God because things have happened in their life they don't understand. Things that have happened in their life, they have questioned God. The things that have happened in their life, they have questioned the goodness of God. 
and those things that come our way, the activity of our lives, instead of being something God uses as He works all things together for good in our lives, what it does is the wrong response to what's happening hardens the heart, hardens the soul. Be somebody who's living a life in, in habitual sin or maybe even secret sin. What's going on within their life, they may seem very religious at church, and we can even stand here in this pulpit and, and preach sermons that, that sound real good, but in reality what's happened is our lifestyle and our heart has become hardened. Therefore, when the Word of God is scattered, is, is taught to us, doesn't do any kind of change. In fact, the Bible to us seems like a, a foreign book that, that maybe we have some knowledge about, but it's not a life-transforming experience. And you watch Jesus. Jesus is there teaching. He's scattering the supernatural Word of God. And you see people with hearts hardened who respond in opposition to Him, whose hearts have been hardened that never get what He's talking about. And their lives were never transformed. But I'm afraid that can happen within God's church. I'd be honest to say to you this morning, some of the meanest people I've ever met are faithful church members. Now, they're really good at coming, and they're really good at knowing what ought to be done in the church. But you begin to look at their heart, begin to look at their response to the things of God, and there's a hardness about their lives that, 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 that doesn't allow them to be able to, to understand the Word of God. And, and what begins to happen to them is that they can become church members and pretty good church members. But when you want to talk about fruit, God doing something through their lives that impacts the world for His kingdom, it's not happening. Could it be? It's because their heart instead of growing soft and pliable that God can speak to, has become hardened. And that hard heart won't receive the Word of God. And so the first thing he says is beware. Beware that as the activity of life happens within you, that instead of being someone that grows even sweeter and sweeter, the heart goes harder and harder. I, I saw that illustrated. And someone in my life I was very close to, and I, I, most guys tell jokes about their mother-in-laws. I don't ever do that because I love my mother-in-law. I didn't want to do that. But Sandy's mother passed away a year ago. One of the things I noticed about her is instead of becoming harder and grumpier and all that, she became sweeter the older she got. Do you know what I think that was? I think that was the condition of her heart. And I want to say to you, I mean, what God wants us to do is, is, is to become more fruitful as we grow and live, instead of letting a hard heart keep us from hearing the Word of God. But then the second one is what I'd call the shallow heart. Look, if you would, verses 20, 21 of that same chapter. For that, as for that which was sown on the uh, rocky ground, this is the one who hears the Word and immediately, look at this, receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but it endures for a while. But what happens? When tribulation, persecution arises on account of this word, immediately he falls away. This is a person that has received Jesus into their life. And yes, they love hearing the word of God. And they love watching it be taught, maybe even be someone who teaches it or preaches it. And, and whenever they first hear it, oh, that's a great thing. They receive it, says, with joy. Yes, yes, that, that ought to be something going on in my life. But what happens? It's because of a rocky soil. It doesn't take root, and therefore it never bears any fruit. And ultimately, because of the rocks in the soil and, and its inability to find nutrition and things that it needs, it dies off and it falls away. Well, that's what it's saying to us about our spiritual life. There's many times we hear the Word of God, and, oh, we, we, we like hearing it. And, oh, that's a great thing. And we, we might even with joy say, boy, that, that's something we ought to hear and something we ought to do. And for a moment, there's, there's a little joy with it, but it doesn't last long. Back to the same old lifestyle, the same attitudes, the, the same thought process, the, the same sin patterns. Well, what's going on? It's what Jesus described as 
rocky soil. Now, you, you would have to know that part of the world to understand what they're talking about. In 1947, 48, 49, when Israel became a state, it was said that that part of the world was God-forsaken. In fact, Mark Twain had visited Israel and said, this is the most desolate place I've ever seen in my life. And yet, if you go there today, 75 years later, you see it blossoming like the Garden of Eden. And, and you go to those places, and, and, and you go along, and you see date palm trees, and you, you see banana trees, and you see all kinds of things flourishing. And yet, there's something you'll always notice whenever they do that is next to it is a pile of rocks or walls that they built around. You say, where'd they get the rocks? Well, what they did is they took rocky soil, they went and they plowed it up, and as they plowed it up, the rocks would kind of boil to the top, and they knew they had to take them out because they knew the rocks would destroy its ability to produce. And so they would take them, and they'd put them in a pile, and then once they finished, they would use it as a wall around their property. And the wall around their property said that we have prepared the soil so it will produce something, and now it's producing in abundance. Well, that's what God says to you and me about our lives is our lives can be filled with a lot of stuff, rocky things, things that are not of God, sinful habits and attitudes. And what happens to us is, is it hinders our ability to be fruitful, hinders our ability to be transformed by the Word of God. And what Jesus was saying in this text is, listen, you, certainly you hear it, and it sounds good for the moment, but the reason why it doesn't have root within your life is there's so many things in there that are hindrances to the growth that God wants you to have. He, he described it for us very well, as Paul did in 1 Corinthians. He said, brothers, I could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Even now you're not ready, for you're still of the flesh. For while there's jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh behaving only in a human ways? Behaving only in a human What he was describing here is there were some things going around in that Corinthian church, some things that were living in the lives of the people, that, that they, they were folks that instead of being the mature, that would lead the church to fruitfulness, they were not like that. They're acting like babies spiritually. Can I be honest with you today? As I examine the church today, I find more infancy in the church than maturity. I find very little fruitfulness. In fact, do you, do you know today that, that only about 6% of the average church in America ever, six, only about 6% of the church ever participate in leading someone to Christ? Instead of being more mature and more effective and more transforming in the world, we, we're people who have been pushed aside, and the world doesn't listen to us anymore. Could it be the reason why it doesn't listen? It looks down within the heart of the people of God's church. Very often, we're not much different than the rest of the world. We watch our attitude and our activities, the things we do, where we spend our money, where we spend our time. And, and they look within our soul, and as they look within our soul, they, they see things within us that are not like Jesus. And they're wondering, all this time in the church, hadn't it changed us some? Hasn't it made us more like Jesus? No, we, we oftentimes just know how to do church better. We know how to build nice buildings and have robe choirs and have programs that seem very nice and good. Instead of being someone who impacts the world for Christ, someone who says, yes, that week of praying for lostness, October the 15th through the 21st, I want to be there because there's a lost community around us, and we need to reach it for the glory of God and for the sake of Christ and the sake of the kingdom. But what happens to us is, is our ground, our heart, has come so filled with so much other things. We can't hear the Word of God and be effective for the kingdom of God. But then he also described, he also described what I would call the crowded heart. Look, if you would, in verse number 22, chapter 13. For what was sown amongst the thorns, this is the one who hears the Word of God. Here's the Word. Listen to this. 
But the cares of the world uh, and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. This is a heart filled with a lot of passions and priorities. This is the heart, uh, as you, you, you look at this, this is a heart filled with lots of things that are not of God. They're not bad things. They're just things that crowd God out of our lives. Yes, we all like having God within our lives, and we all like being able to have someone we pray to, but in reality, God's just journeying with us as we go along our way, and when we get a problem, we go back and get him and say, would you solve this for me? Would you help me with this? Jesus said that's a person who hadn't decided who's in charge of their life, and it makes it very easy for the things of this world that create passions for us, that priorities for us, things that we want to do more than we want to serve God and love God and follow His will, and those things began to be the priorities of our life. Now, that doesn't mean God's not in our lives. It just means we have pushed Him over to the side decided the passions of our lives and the priorities of our lives are more important than God. And I'm afraid what we do in our lives is we allow things that we love to become things we love more than God. Now, God, God tells us we can love lots of stuff. We can love our mates. We can love our families. We can love the cowboys as long as they're winning, okay? We, we can love all kinds of things in this world and have some passion for it. But what he's saying right here is we may have some loves and some passions, but there ought to be one that's number one. And those things go along, but they'll go along submissive to the will and the ways of God. And we don't let God fit into our world. We let our world fit into our God. And we begin to say, God, you're in charge here. And I want you to know, Lord, I have a lot of things that mean a lot to me. But I'm not going to let those things control my life. I'm going to let you control my life. I'm afraid what happens to us is our pursuit of making a living becomes our God. Our pursuit of pleasure becomes our God. Our pursuit of, of, of doing some things that we like to do becomes our God rather than God being God. So what happens to us? We show up at church. We go to a Bible study. We open our Bibles. The Word of God is scattered within our life. But what does the Word of God have to do? It has to fit into where we're going, apart from God. Maybe even good things. But in, God has to fit in with us. And the ways of God have to fit in. And what happens is it says it chokes the Word of God. It causes it not to be something that impacts our lives and changes our lives. I, I remember when I was a brand new believer in Christ as a college student. I was fortunate to be involved with Campus Crusade for Christ, and they have a little four spiritual laws. I used it so much I've got that thing memorized, just as there are physical laws that govern physical universe, so I can tell you the whole thing, okay? Because I loved it so much, it was the gospel. But Bill Bright also produced a, a little pamphlet called The Spirit-Filled Life. And it's a little blue pamphlet. I remember I always carried them around with me because I knew how important it was for me to learn how to walk by the Spirit. Well, Bill Wright made it really simple. And, and, and being a guy like me, you need to keep it simple, okay? He, he had three little circles that he would describe your life. The first circle. And in the middle of the circle, he had a little H that was the throne of your life. And he said, what you have is, is you have self or ego on the throne of your life. And he had a cross, and the cross was outside the circle. And he said, the first step of walking with God is to get Jesus inside the life. And boy, we love to do that, don't we? Get Jesus inside the life. But then the second circle was a circle in which Jesus was inside the life, but self or ego was still on that H, that throne. What he talked about there is, you know something? You will not be filled with the Spirit of God if your self is still on the throne. And what he did with the third circle is he had self down to the side, and he had a cross, and he had the cross there up on the throne. And the Spirit-filled life was not talking about some spiritual wild experience. He was just simply saying, God, you're in charge of my life. And today, I'm not going to let you be crowded out 
by all this other stuff, that good stuff, things that I enjoy. I'm going to make sure that the cross of Jesus Christ is sitting on the throne of my life. And he said, I want to make sure that Jesus is in charge of what's happening to my life. As you look at your life, do you see a hardness? You see a life filled with a lot of stuff? Do you see a life in which God's constantly having to fight for who's going to be in charge? Constantly what we're doing is allowing the cares of the world, (laughs) the deceitfulness of riches, to crowd God out. Is it any wonder then? Is it any wonder then that we're not more fruitful? Is it any wonder then that, that our lives are not impacting the kingdom of God? Could it be that what God's saying is it, maybe First Baptist Richardson doesn't just need a new pastor. What that new pastor needs is a bunch of hearts that are ready to be fruitful. What God's saying, he's not only preparing a man to lead you, could it be what he's doing is preparing the church? So within the Word of God is scattered. Something happens that's supernatural. That supernatural is described in that last verse. For the, what is sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the Word of God. That word understand is more than knowledge. It's knowledge that has gotten down into the heart, been applied to the life. And he indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, and another sixty, and another thirty. What he's saying is the Word of God should be doing something supernatural in this world. First of all, supernatural within our soul. If within our soul, as God takes an old carnal, fleshly person like you and me, and by His Word and by the work of His Spirit, He makes us to be more like Jesus, and guess what? Anytime that happens, it's a miracle of God. But it's the combination of the Word of God and a heart that is ready for the Word of God. God puts those two things together, and He takes human beings like you and me and does something supernatural. Changes our attitude and our heart and our activities, where we spend our money, where we spend our time. And as he does all of that, the world looks and says, wow, that person's different. A family looks at that person and says, oh my goodness, there's something going on in that person's life that's not present anywhere else. And what is it? It's the work of the Spirit of God. And the fruit that it's bearing is what's known in Galatians as the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, all those kind of things that are like God. Instead of us being fleshly, carnal, selfish, we become people like Jesus. And where did that happen? Was it the quality of our Bible teaching? Was it the niceness of the church? Was it the fact we got air-conditioned rooms and great choirs and orchestra? No. It's because we decided to get our hearts ready. And God transforms our lives. And when He transforms our lives, He makes it obvious to everybody around us that there's something special happening in us. Therefore, what happens to us is we begin to impact our world. We begin to see people coming to Jesus. We begin to see our faith impacting other people. We begin to see our prayers having power in people's lives. We begin to see our our lives and our resources counting for the kingdom and God supernaturally using you and me in his kingdom's work. Now, did that happen because we're in a great church? Well, that's part of it, and you are. But also a major part of it is we've gotten our hearts ready for the Word of God. And when the Word of God is scattered amongst us, God does something, something supernatural, something special. We begin to see a fruitfulness to our lives that's powerful and attractive to this world. Where's your heart today? If you today were allow someone to take a snapshot of your heart, 
What would they say? You know, I, I have had a heart attack when I was 49, and I've got two stents in my heart that I've had for these seven years since I was 49, or maybe a little more, okay? I don't know. But one of the things I like for them to do is take a picture of my heart. They do a nuclear stress test on me to see about the circulation. I want to know how good my heart's working. Would it be today? That God wants to look into our spiritual heart. And we will allow His Spirit to show us where it's gotten hard, where it's gotten shallow, when things have crowded God out of that heart. And why would God want to do that? It's because He wants every one of us in this room to be fruitful for His name and His glory. I remember a man in our church several years ago. He was a Sunday school teacher, worked in our youth ministry. And one day during a special emphasis we were having, I'll never forget him coming. I can just close my eyes and see him down there at front. And I, I was led of the Lord just to go down and pray with him because I'd known him for many, many years, even before I came to feel her. And he said, I've got to talk to you. He said, I'm a good church member and probably a pretty good Sunday school teacher, but things are not right in my heart. When we got together later and talked, discovered that he was a guy that was uh, on the road with his work and had become in, involved in immoral activities and stuff. He said to me, Gary, that, that can't be true if I'm walking with the Lord. I want God to, to do something in my life. Could you let me search my heart? And what he began to do is he began to search his heart. He realized that maybe as a child, when he'd walked down the aisle of that church and didn't baptize, nothing had happened spiritually, only a church membership. Later, he came back to me and he said, this is going to sound crazy to you, but I'm not a Christian. So we got on our knees, bowed our heads. He prayed, gave his life to Christ. He resigned that class because he knew that, that he wasn't ready to be a teacher at that point and that he needed to get some things right in his family and his life. And he began to do that, clear out the rocks. Later on, people at the church saw someone different, ordained him as a deacon, later become chairman. Even right now is in a foreign country doing ministry. What changed? Was it my preaching that changed? Was it the direction of our church? No, it was the condition of his heart. When his heart changed, he changed. When he changed, the world around him changed. He became effective in the kingdom of God. Isn't that what you want today? I, I don't know about you. There, there's a lot of other things to do than just come sit in a room and listen to something, watch something. There's better things to do than just gain some knowledge about an ancient book. There's the kingdom of God. God wants us in the middle of. And the way he's going to do it is if we're willing to open our heart. Now, some of you this morning, I, I probably know 20 people by a name in this room at best. So I don't know you, but I would guess this morning there could be some folks here like that young man. What's hindered your growth is you've never had the life-transforming experience of salvation. Baptized, member of a church, all that kind of stuff. But you know Jesus is not living in there. We're getting ready to have an invitation. Wow, there's nothing we'd rather do than help you come to Jesus. But could it be? along with that. There's some folks in this church that need to make a public acknowledgement that I need the prayers of God because my heart's not right. And everybody around me probably knows it. And today, I want God to do a searching in my soul that only God could do because I want God's Word to be fruitful in my life in the days ahead. Bow your head, please, with me for a moment, would you? Could I ask you this morning, when we take that
God takes that picture of your heart. What does God see? What does God see? Does he see a heart ready for his word? Or does he see something else? Could it be today the reason why you're not fruitful? Some things happen in your heart that hinder the word of God taking root and bearing fruit. Would you be willing to get those right today for your sake? And for God's sake, Father, take this moment. Take this moment and be at work. Be at work, O God. And show us that you still bless your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stand together. We're going to sing the song, I Surrender All. You have pastors who will be here at the front as they come and try to help you. If you want someone to pray with you, maybe you just want to pray by yourself. But today, if you would like to know Jesus as Savior, we'd love to show you how that could happen. You step out and you come as Andy leads us in our surrender all. Could you? sing that next verse instead of just singing let's let the words of those verses Lord you're my God you're my king I worship you let those words sink into your heart do with what God wants you to do and in the choir leads us you bow your head and close your eyes would you please